Amen. I think we better move this before we have a great fall. I'll forget about that cord and we'll be a definite disaster. Um, I just want to tell Ken, thank you. I don't know if you got my notes. Uh, sometimes we put Ken on the spot. Literally, he got my notes at 4 o'clock. I mean 5 o'clock, not 4 o'clock, sorry. He wanted them at 4. So, I appreciate everything Ken and Mike and all those do with the sound and video. Um, turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. I want to say the choir done an amazing job this morning. The actors. Everything that went on. Proved to be worthy when five souls are saved. Some churches don't even see that in five years. We don't serve a dead God. We serve a risen Savior. And He's still alive. Thank God for that. He's given us that resurrection power. And we do need to tell Him we love Him more often. I'm sure we don't tell Him enough. If you got your Bibles, let's all stand and as we read. I feel like we probably need a little exercise tonight after, as much as some of us probably eat for lunch. <laughs> Actually, I was confessing. <laughs> Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. It says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to draw toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. That poor Mary didn't even get a name. The other Mary. To see the sepulchre. Sorry, I can't even talk tonight. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment, raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the woman, Fear not. For I know that ye seek Jesus, who was crucified. I want to stop there, because for one, y'all are expecting an Easter message. You got that this morning. Believe it or not, I'm going down a different path. There's three words that I want us to see that we're going to talk about tonight. And it's in verse 2. And it says, Behold, there was a great earthquake for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it or sat on it. Can you imagine? I would think when this angel came in you'd expect this big hoopla running in this whole big thing running around. I imagine them standing there like yeah! I could just picture you know, all this greatness that they would be doing. But they sat on it. They sat on it. Instead, that was their great entrance. Now, now that angel could have stood, but the angel chose to sit. And not just sit anywhere. The angel sat at that certain place at a very strategic place. The title of my message tonight is Watch Where You Sit. Watch Where You Sit. Let's pray. Dear Prince of Father, we just thank you for your many blessings, Lord. I just thank you for the soul saved this morning. Through the message, through the cantata, through the moving of the Holy Spirit. Lord, we ask for that movement again tonight, Lord. Lord, we just ask that you put your power upon your word, Lord. We've already heard your power through song, Lord. Lord, just bless every word, Lord. Just empty me of any self. Not let one word come out of my mouth tonight, Lord, that's of Tony. 
Lord, just speak to our hearts, Lord. Anything we came in here with, Lord, let us leave it at the door, Lord, just seeking your face tonight. Lord, I just thank you for what you're going to do. Because we come expecting a blessing tonight. It's in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. I'll let you sit now. How did you choose where you would sit tonight? Some of you said because it's closest to the back door. Where are you sitting? How would you choose it? Some of you close to the exit. Some of us have many factors. Some of you sit towards the back. It's closer to the bathroom. It always depends on the venue, where we're at, the living room, the concert, the restaurant. People that know me know I certain, sit certain ways in a restaurant. I don't put my back to a door. I want to know when something's about to hit me from behind. I feel like I can protect my family when I can see what's coming. Don't ask me why I do that and what started it, because I don't know. Sometimes we sit certain places so we can sit with certain people. But there's a reason you chose to sit where you sit. Brandon sits in that back chair because he wants to be closest to the door and hope nobody sees him. And he's probably going to be mad I called him out. I thought it was pretty funny. It ain't the first time I've been in trouble with Brandon. Won't be the last. I do love you, buddy. Just making sure you're paying attention. Where you sit really matters. We don't think about it, but where we sit really matters. I hope you, as you start to realize that I'm not just, I'm, not, I'm less interested in where you sit, your butt, but I'm more interested in, number one, where your soul sits. Where is your soul set? You know what your soul is right when your soul is right. This angel rolled back the stone and sat on it. I think this is very significant. Because here's what happened. Because I believe it is a symbolic as it would that, that the thing that that angel would stand in all its glory. But instead he set to show marrying them what was meant to defeat Jesus was actually been rolled away. They sat there on purpose. It was a sign. They didn't have to say anything. They did, but they didn't have to. Can you imagine when they walk up and that stone is rolled away and there's angels sitting on top? You know something has happened. There's no doubt. It's very obvious that something has happened. There's really only two variables to us sitting down. The first one is the reason that they sat down, and two, the place where they sat down. The place where you sit down. First Kings chapter 19 says this, And when he saw that he arose and went for his life, and came to Bathsheba, which belongeth to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a Jupiter tree. Jupiter, juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die. And said, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life for I am not better than my father's. The point we see here is to point out is that it was not just where he sat down in this place, but it's where he set his soul at. He set his soul down and tried to give it up. He said, I'm done. He was weary. He was done. He chose to sit. Let's do a little 
history here. A Jupiter tree is also referred to as a broom bush. It's native to an area in this text to dry land. It's always growing somewhere where it's dry. If they walked up on a broom bush, they knew they weren't going to be a full supply of water next door. They knew they was in dry land. He was in dry land and was ready to give up. Three things we need to know about a broom bush is this. One, it grows in the desert. It's in a dry place. And if you find yourself under a broom bush, you know you've gone to a dry place. Don't sit down in our life we hit dry spells and we just want to sit down and give up right there I can't do this no more it's tough what do I do we want to give in oftentimes requested just to give in quit when you hit that dry place in your life don't sit down because when you sit down, you get comfortable and you stay there. I think in a new church, we shouldn't put seats in. Sometimes we get too comfortable. Sometimes we get comfortable with sleep through service. So if any of you caught sleeping tonight, I might call you out. I do that sometimes. Don't sit down. A broom bush... A, bro, a broom bush has bitter roots that are poor and unaccustomed to eating. You wouldn't eat of this tree. If you found yourself eating this, you was in true, terrible situation. You was extremely poor, extremely hungry. Job 30 says this, For want and famine they were solitary. Fleeing unto the wilderness in former time, Dissolent and waste, who cut up milos by the bushes and Jupiter roots for their meat. They went to rock bottom to eat. They went to dry land and was dwelling there. Tonight, are you in dry land and are you sitting there dwelling? Where's your soul sitting? The third thing about this tree is their twigs were used for binding. It is a place where you become bound. Elijah had gone to a place he should not have ever gone. To a source he should not have gone to and was bound by it. And he sat there his soul right there he set his soul where he felt bound and was ready to give I want us to compare two significance here though back in 1 Kings chapter 19 it said they sat down under a Jupiter tree and he requested for himself that he might die but back in Matthew 28 2 we see this and behold there was a great earthquake for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it or sat on it see the difference here is one sat under and one sat on does anybody know what sat in the Greek really means it really just means sat moving on I thought I'd put that in there for a bonus but to sit on the definition of on or upon is this to be above beyond or more than we've seen in Matthew they sit on they was above it they was above the problem Elijah sat in his problem and sulked and give up the angel sat upon so where you put your soul and set your soul is important. The angel on the stone here, the stone represented what the enemy tried to use to stop Jesus. The thing the devil has tried to stop you with can become the very thing 
you sit on to declare the goodness of God. And the angel sat on it. It's time that we sit on ours. What was meant to bring defeat became a seat. What was meant to bring defeat merely became a seat. What is the enemy he tried what has the enemy tried to stop you with? What stone has he tried to roll over in front of your of you? Your guilt, your shame, or your past mistakes? Your unforgiveness? Your bad report? You can either sit under your circumstances or you can sit on them. But you can't do both. We got to choose whether we're going to sit in our circumstances or sit on our circumstances and allow God to choose to win the victory. Where you sit in your soul. Where you sit doesn't only affect you because where you sit, others will sit there too. It's generational. Where you sit is generational. 2 Kings chapter 10 verse 30 says this, And the Lord said unto Jehu, Because thou hast done well in executing that which is right in my eyes, you notice he said in my eyes and not your eyes. And has done unto the house of Ahab according to all that was in my heart. Thy children of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. He's going to reward generations down the road for him being faithful. Jehu's behavior affected where his great great grandsons would sit. What you do and where you sit will dictate way down the line where your grandchildren, children, great grandchildren will sit. Dads, if you will sit in, sit on your temper, your kids will learn to sit under it too. Mothers, if you will sit on the anxiety, your kids will never sit under it. Maybe if you sat on the curse of debt and started paying it off, your kids would never sit under it either. As a leader, where you sit does not only influence them, but it, everyone around you. If you're negative, others will be too. If you're depressed, others will be too. If you will sit on it, others will never sit under it. It's time that we learn where to sit. How do I do that, you ask? We have the perfect example in Christ. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Wherefore seeing we also are compressed about with a great cloud of witness. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth easily beset us. And let us run with patience. Patience. It doesn't say just run the race. You realize it says with patience. Because there's going to be trials and tribulation. The race that is set before us. That's how we do that. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cry, cross despising the shame he despised the cross he didn't want the cross he endured it because he looked past the cross and saw joy he could have sat there but he didn't Thank God that Friday he didn't just sit there and say, oh, that's okay, I'm not going to do this. Not my will, but thine be done. And then sit down at the right hand of the throne of God, for consider him that endureth such co contradiction of sinners against himself. Lest ye be wearied, 
and faint in your minds. It's okay to sit down, but where you choose to sit is significant. On your drive home from work, exhausted, worn out, choose your seat wisely. That was hit home with me. When someone wrongs you and you have to decide what to do, choose your seat wisely. When you're discouraged and you have, been, you have a decision to make, choose your seat wisely. We get to choose. Number two, saving seats. I don't know about y'all, but I hate saving seats. And one of the worst places to save seats is at the movie theater. Okay? I don't go to the movie theater often. For one, you had to make a house payment to go in there. Because who wants the little popcorn? I mean, really. That's for the, like, the two-year-olds. That's like you know, unlawful punishment. But you save seats because you don't want people to come in. And then they turn the lights out. And you always got that one friend, Eston, who's going to be really, really late. <laughs> they got to step over everything. If you Look, if you hang out with me, my legs are go for days. So when people want to step over you, it's a problem, okay? You know, it's just honestly, it's a problem. We hate saving seats. And every time I think about you in a movie theater and someone climbs over you, and we was at one recently and somebody walked all the way down the aisle for someone to look at them and say, as Forrest Gump and them said, seat's taken. Can't sit here. That's why I don't like saving seats. Now I tell somebody the seat's taken. In psychology, they call this your seat of emotion they begin to research and have, have a brain and the brain houses in place where your emotions were seated and refer to it as a seat of emotion your brain <clears throat> did you know that you have three brains some of you were still looking for the first one but, but you have three main functions of your brain yeah, some of y'all still trying to figure out if you got the brain or not. Or who don't have one. Three brains in one. The first one is your survival brain. All living cre creatures have this part of the brain. The most basic brain structure is dedicated to physical survival, controls our functions like heartbeat, respiration, reproduction, Reflex, instincts, etc. It's mostly involuntary. Number two is our logical brain. The very last part to develop. It's our executive skills like planning, weighing alternatives, making decisions, regulating emotional impulses. Doesn't fully develop until our mid-20s. So those were teens. Remember, parents, you still got hope. That usually don't develop for a while. In some cases, it's a little less than, a little longer than the 20s. Some of you are probably still waiting until your 40s. But this is what we really want to talk about. The last part of your brain is the emotional brain. The part of your brain is also referred to as your seat of emotion. This is the part of your brain that chooses where your emotions are going to take a seat. There's a constant fight happening within yourself as to where, as to who is going to take the seat with your emotions. I like it when your modern research shows something that the Bible already has showed thousands of years ago. Philippians chapter 4. Be careful or do not be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication 
with thanksgiving let your request be known unto God and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep or guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus it is up to you to save a seat for the right emotion you choose your emotions and where they're going to sit you choose if they're going to sit on your shoulders for everybody to see you have to guard that seat it's a seat that has to be protected you have to tell fear seats taken can't sit here you have to tell anger seats taken can't sit here you have to tell anxiety seats taken can't sit here you have to tell insecurity seats taken can't sit here second corinthians chapter 10 verse 5 casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringeth into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ we got to bring our thoughts in and allow him to control them we got to direct everything we do towards him every time Satan throws something our way and we feel beat down you need to look at Satan and tell him the seat's taken Christ sits there you get to choose where you sit down where your mind sits where your heart sits and where your emotion sits the angel showed us exactly the right way to sit right on top of the very thing that is trying to hold Jesus back what in your life is trying to hold Jesus back it's time that you start sitting on it and say, not today. Not today. The old shirt was right. Not today, Satan. It needs to be a thing every day. Where you sit, sit is significant. You have to save a seat. But the best news is this. Number three. A seat has been saved for you. Now it's no fun say, saving seats for other people. But it's a lot of fun when someone saves a seat for you. No greater feeling than when someone saved, a, saved you a seat. You get to walk past everyone, walk right up to the front and sit down. There's a lot of saved seats. Nobody wanted to come sit tonight with you, Jamie. I don't know why. I think they thought I was going to sweat a or spit it could happen it's probably going to happen but there's a constant fight happening within yourself sorry walk right up to the front and sit down and because someone used their authority to save a seat for you a seat that you do not belong in you did not earn it you did not pay the price for it but you're allowed to sit there Here's the good news. If you're a Christ follower, Ephesians 2, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceedingly, exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith. If you're a Christ follower, a seat has been saved for you. And that not of yourselves, he had to do it. It is a gift from God, not a works that any man should boast. Revelation chapter 3. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. Can you imagine what that seat's going to be like? Even as I also overcame and am set down with my Father in His throne, he that ha have an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches.
when you get a ticket somewhere, you always have to make sure you sit down in the right place. Whether it's a concert or an event or anything, you always have to check your ticket. And if you're like me, you can't count rows, so you always end up in the wrong spot. Somebody has to move you. But where's your seat checked to tonight? We need to look down in our seat of emotions. You should look down at your seat of insecurities and fears. Chances are we're sitting in the wrong seats. God reserved seating for Gideon as a mighty warrior. But Gideon was still seated in a section called weakness. God reserved seating for Moses as a deliverer. deliverer but Moses was seated in a section called fear. Maybe you're seated in a section called complacency or in a section called comfort. Tonight God's calling you to the front of the lines. It's time to leave. It's time to get in. It's time to give like you've never given before. It's time to be a contributor and not a consumer. It's time that we take the seat that's been reserved for us. It's time to jump in and get going. The days are drawing nigh. And the laborers are few because they won't come to the front of the line. If you're a Christ follower, you've been called to the front of the line. But you're allowing complacency and comfort and fear and weakness to hold you back. It's time to take the seed that's been promised to you. Maybe tonight you're seated in a section called regret, fear, shame, pain, sin. God has saved you a seat. You need to get your ticket checked and take that seat. If he's calling you tonight because you don't know him as your savior, it's time to change your ticket in and claim your seat. He came to remind you today that the price of your admission has been paid in full. It's not in the nosebleed sections. Your seat for Christ is in heavenly places. I'll close with this, Galatians 3.13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is every one that hangeth on a tree. Christ paid the full price to set us free from the curse of the law. He absorbed it completely as to become a curse in this place, in our place. I close tonight and ask you, have you claimed your seat at the front of the line? Where's your soul sitting? Where are you sitting? Where we sit's important. Where we sit ourselves and take claim dictates our life. And what we do affects others around us for a long, long, long time. Every head bowed and every eye closed.